Hello, everybody, and welcome back. In this module, what we're going to be doing is exploring a new branch of psychology called developmental psychology. We're going to be doing this from a number of different angles, but in this first lecture, what we're going to do is just provide you with an overview of the general things that people in developmental psychology look at. It's not going to necessarily be a comprehensive review of every single thing that developmental psychologists can study, but hopefully after we're done with this particular lecture, you'll have a better sense of what somebody means when they call themselves a developmental psychologist. To introduce you to developmental psychology and give you a better sense of what exactly developmental psychologists do, I always like to start off this module with a bit of an activity. This one requires you to do something kind of odd. What I'd like for you to do is think back to when you're a child, when you were maybe seven, eight, ten years old, however far back you can go. And I want you to assess what that person was like. And I want you to then compare that person to who you are now, looking at some of the similarities and differences that you might be able to identify. Maybe you notice differences in your physical ability or personality characteristics or cognitive abilities or even ability to kind of handle different social environments. There's going to be differences from person to person when you're engaged in this, but if you can take a minute or two to reflect on these things, they can help you when we look at what you just did, get a better sense of what developmental psychology really is all about. So if you need to, pause and then come back when you have thought it out and we'll go to the next slide. Now I'm guessing most of you, if you did actually participate in that activity, noticed not only that were, were there some similarities from things that you were like back then to what you're like now, but also that there was a lot of changes that occurred. And that process of change and that also process of consistency is what interests people in developmental psychology. In essence, what people in developmental psychology are doing is tracking people from the moment they're conceived, the moment they become this first cell that we called a zygote, all the way to the moment of our death. And, and maybe even for some developmental psychologists, if we look at the impact death has on others, even for a short period of time after our death. Developmental psychologists look at this unfolding process, these changes that occur within us, so they can do things like make better sense of how things happen for most individuals or, or what could be the source of the different things that are occurring. And to understand how they can do this, we have to understand a basic premise that most developmental psychologists use to understand human development. The general idea can be whittled down to something I like to call the snowflake analogy. This is not something that should be tied to politics in this class. Instead, when we're talking about the snowflake analogy, we're talking about a unique characteristic that everybody tends to mention when they hear about snowflakes, something that maybe Californians aren't necessarily familiar with, but others around the world have probably heard before. If you had to list the one weird fact that you've heard about all snowflakes, I'm guessing all of you would say that no two snowflakes are alike. And this is kind of what developmental psychologists believe about people. The, the assumption is, is that not everybody is the same. In fact, nobody is really the same as anybody. There's always gonna be unique facets to all of us. But with respect to that snowflake analogy, it's not the only thing we know about snowflakes. There's lots of people studying how things evolve that can tell you about how different uh, temperatures, different altitudes, different precipitation levels, can actually impact the formation of a snowflake and actually change some of the structures to it in a semi-predictable way. They might not be able to predict everything down to each and every element of each snowflake, but understanding those things can help them understand how an each an individual snowflake is formed. This is exactly what developmental psychologists are doing. They're saying each of us are unique, but if we know about certain things that happen in your life or certain environments that you're exposed to, or just kind of if you undergo the, the normal unfolding process in a person's life, you know, these things should happen to you. And understanding those triggers and understanding that unfolding process is, again, what developmental psychology is all about. 
you're looking for the basic premise of, of what we're tracking in developmental psychology, as I mentioned, we're studying people from conception to death, from the moment they're one cell to the moment when those cells stop working. And when we're doing that, we're looking for the changes that happen, the causes behind those, and also to understand these things better, we're looking for the abnormal, looking for people that didn't necessarily full unfold in the typical way, or things that happen to individuals that were atypical and maybe changed the course of development for an individual. And this is something that can be looked at in a number of different places in our life. For example, we can actually go to the moment of birth and look at this unfolding process and try to understand how certain things we might have encountered even before we were born started to shape the way our bodies and the way parts of our mind might eventually develop. Many biologists and doctors reference something that's administered to young children right at birth called the APGAR scale. It's actually a test that's given to children that looks at a bunch of different types of functioning. And believe it or not, in the very first moment you were born, you were already be giving, being given tests. They look for things like whether or not your heart is beating correctly, whether or not your respiratory functioning looks good, whether or not your musculature is okay. Uh, but with respect to what a developmental psychologist might look at, we're looking at here is the ability for those sensory organs and the brain to start working correctly and some of the basic what we call reflexes to be working appropriately as well. We can test for visual abilities, but also we know that visual abilities are usually very poor for newborns. We can look for whether or not hearing is present at the level it should be, whether or not our taste system is intact, and we can look at whether or not the neurons within our nervous system have started to cluster appropriately and have gone to the right places so we can have these really critical things called reflexory responses. Just understand how important these reflexory responses are. I uploaded a video that covers some of the basic reflexes that are tested in this APGAR test and also some of the implications tied behind them, like when they need to emerge, what it indicates if they're not there, and when they should, many of them, actually disappear and what it means if it doesn't disappear. This is, of course, just one small moment in our life, but I always like to cover this in a developmental psych class because it really allows you to appreciate how when we're looking at this unfolding process, it really starts before birth. We can look at how our nervous system, how our mind is already forming in utero and how it continues to form from that moment we're born until the moment we actually pass. Another great example of how we can study this unfolding process relates to something I'm guessing many of you are still slightly cautious about or, or maybe uncomfortable looking at, that wonderful time in our life that all of us call puberty. Uh, puberty obviously has a lot of different things tied to it, but if we're looking at it on a biological level, puberty is obviously marked by this dramatic shift that occurs in our body due to the changes in different what we call hormones or chemicals circulating through our bloodstream and the, the not only the presence of them, but the persistence of them and how they shift a lot of different components of our body. For both males and females, puberty is triggered by activation in the brain. We have a structure in our brains called the hypothalamus that starts to pump out very specific hormones that then communicate with other structures near the brain called the pituitary gland, and that information causes more blood to change and more chemicals to change within our system, which sends information down to our sex organs called the gonads, where other types of hormones are produced. Usually people, when they talk about this particular change in life, tend to talk a lot about changes in estrogen, or what's sometimes called estradiol, and testosterone. For both women and men, there's a huge increase in both types of chemicals, but gender differentiation, lots of other things tied to biological changes can be predicted by how much change in estrogen and testosterone occurs for both genders. For women or people who contain XX chromosomes and aren't insensitive to specific hormones, we usually see puberty starting fairly early, somewhere between the ages of nine, 10, or 11. But there are some where there's a little bit of a delay and they don't start puberty until 12 or 13. 
For men, usually puberty starts a little bit later. Some boys will start to undergo puberty at around 11 or 12, but most don't start until they're around 13, 14, maybe even 15, depending upon the boy. And when we look at what triggers this, we've tied a lot of different things to puberty. But what a lot of researchers have also focused on is how these changes in our bodies not only precipitate changes in our, our thinking and our biological functioning, but how they change our social worlds, how they can impact things like stress and relationships and confidence levels and, and even things like performance in school. A large number of developmental psychologists have focused their attention on puberty for a variety of different reasons. Another thing that we can do when looking at puberty is examine what maybe triggers puberty a little bit earlier than we would expect. There's been a, a bevy of research that's been published over the last couple decades looking at the impacts on stress and weight and, and diet uh, on the, the emergence of puberty in both boys and girls. And there's been some research that's focused a lot on the specific type of puberty that we call precocious puberty. Puberty that doesn't occur just a few weeks or a few months earlier than expected, but maybe even a few years earlier than expected. There are, unfortunately, in this world, children that are undergoing puberty at age seven or eight. And that might just seem like an oddity, but researchers looking at precocious puberty have suggested that this can have a very detrimental impact on these children. But what's really interesting when we talk about this detrimental impact is gender does seem to matter a lot. Girls are not only much more likely to undergo this experience of puberty, in fact, they're 10 times in most statistics more likely to undergo precocious puberty than boys, but the impacts on girls is much greater than it is on boys. In fact, some research has suggested that boys are kind of immune to any of the major impacts of precocious puberty that we see being inflicted on a wide range of girls, not only in the United States, but across the world. And looking at how these things play out, what's the trigger of precocious puberty and, and why it seems to impact girls, not only at the moment, but oftentimes throughout their life, has been a source of interest within the field of developmental psychology. Now, I, I don't want us to spend too much time kind of focusing on this or trying to dissect this because it's not the point of developmental psych class. But what I wanna do when covering this is give you again a, a glimpse at how developmental psychologists can address different points in our life and look at not only the unfolding process, but the irregular so we can understand that unfolding process significantly better and also what happens if things don't happen as predicted. And that's really at the heart of a lot of developmental psychology, looking at these change processes how we should alter throughout our lives and what the impacts of these alterations actually are. But there are, as I mentioned, a number of people that have focused on the atypical, things that don't work out the way we would expect, partially because that can be interesting on its own, but also because it can really illuminate how critical that normal unfolding or typical unfolding process actually is in most of our lives. But it's also important to note that there are some people in developmental psychology that don't go the route of just studying these changes that occur within us. Another big portion of people in developmental psychology have focused their interests on looking at what the source of some of our changes in our life actually are, and also what the sources of individual differences actually are. And this brings us to a very important topic that will bleed into a number of different areas that we'll talk about throughout the semester, a concept called heritability. This notion that a lot of our personal characteristics might be a byproduct of biology. In particular, the genetic information that we contain within each and every cell in our body. We're talking about something being extremely heritable. When we say that the heritability of a specific characteristic is high, what we're inferring is that somebody's biology was a major player in the development of something. And this development could be physical, it could be mental, it could be social. There's lots of different ways that things could be linked to heritability, but the general idea is that high heritability is a byproduct of genetics, or sometimes what you might hear referred to as nature. When something is low in heritability, 
we assume that that thing is linked to instead the environment, something that somebody was exposed to. Now, there's lots of different types of environmental factors that can be studied. Lots of research has gone into looking at shared versus non-shared environments of siblings and, and how different types of encounters might shape us at different points in our life. But the general idea with heritability research is if we're talking about something being low in heritability, we're focusing our attention then on the social environment that may be brought forth a specific thing that a researcher is interested in. And if we want to figure out how researchers have tried to tackle this idea of heritability, we can look at most early research that focused on sibling studies, looking at kind of the overlaps in performance between siblings or characteristics between siblings, so we can do some type of mathematical computation to figure out where something is actually coming from. Early sibling research focused its attention on different types of sibling pairs that exist. In particular, lots of comparisons were done between what we call identical or monozygotic twins, twins that came from the same genetic information, and either typical siblings or fraternal, which is dizygotic or twins that come from actually different sets of gene combinations. There are studies that have also looked at adopted children to try to understand heritability better, but all these studies have been done, regardless of the exact focus, to try to kind of ratio out how much of something is being impacted by genes and how much something is being impacted by the environment. Understand that we can just look at a slide that's looked at the heritability of intelligence by looking at different overlaps between sibling pairs. You can see here identical twins, especially those that were reared together, tend to have a very high overlap in intelligence performance tests performance on intelligence tests. As you get further and further away from a perfect overlap in genes, you see lower and lower overlaps in performances on these tests. But it's not a non-existence overlap when we get to individuals that were completely unrelated, raised in the same environment, which does suggest that even if heritability is strong, heritability is not the only thing that determines our performance on those intelligence tests. Instead, it's the byproduct of an interaction between maybe some biological predispositions and some of the things that we've encountered as we've been raised and as we've lived with certain families or certain people for a large portion of our life. But this research on heritability is only one type of research that's been done over the years. It's definitely the most prominent type. In fact, most people studying heritability nowadays still tend to lean on that particular approach. But there are others who have tried to tackle this idea of heritability from a different perspective. One of the more notable ones over the years is a researcher named Thomas Bouchard, who ran for many years this study that we nowadays call the Minnesota Twin Registry. It was actually a study that looked for not just any identical twins, but twins who happened to be reared apart when they were adopted by separate families at birth after they were born. What Bouchard did in this Minnesota Twin Registry was track down these twins who had been raised in different worlds, not knowing that they had a twin, and asked them a number of questions about themselves. He would ask them a large number of questions, trying to explore if there were unexpected overlaps between twins that maybe we wouldn't predict could be linked to our genetics. And just so you can get a sense of how these case studies worked, how this twin research worked, I thought we'd discuss one of his more famous studies, one that has been listed in almost every textbook since he published it, a story of what we now call the two Jims, two boys who happened to be separated at birth and both be named Jim by their parents. The first Jim that Bouchard went on to meet was a, a Jim named Jim Lewis. And he interviewed Jim, asked him a whole bunch of things about his life, and found out some odd facts. Things like he was divorced from a woman named Linda, had remarried a woman named Betty, was making enough money to be described as middle class, was described by his new wife as romantic and affectionate, had a son, I believe, from his first marriage named James Allen, a dog named Toy, worked at a wood shop, loved stock car racing, drank Miller Lights, was a chain smoker, and he chewed his nails to the nub. These were the odd, weird facts that Bouchard would get from these individuals. As I mentioned, 
he would track down the other twin after asking a whole series of questions to get to these odd facts. And when he met the other Jim, he found out that there were some interesting overlaps between him and his brother. The second Jim, who happened to be named Jim Springer, was also divorced from a woman named Linda, happened to remarry a woman named Betty, who was in the middle class in terms of his income, was described by his new wife as romantic and affectionate, had a son named James Allen, had a dog named Toy, worked at a wood shop, loved stock car racing, drank Miller Lite, was a chain smoker, chewed his nails to the nub, and also struggled with migraines. I'm guessing most of you, as you're listening to this, seeing me page through these facts, are a little disconcerted by the oddity and the overlap between these two gyms. Many people were. Bouchard kind of came to the forefront of the conversation when talking about heritability, when he not only publishes information about the two gyms, but on multiple twin pairs that had odd overlaps just like this. And in fact, it brought on this conversation between psychologists, between people trying to understand what caused us to be who we were, that, that led people to conclude that maybe a big portion of random things in our life are more linked to our genes than we thought. Maybe our preferences for specific flavors, maybe our differences in, in terms of who we might be attracted to or what we might want to name somebody could potentially be linked to some genetic code that we have within our bodies. But before you get too excited about Bouchard, like many psychologists did, I do want to caution you that there was also a lot of pushback that started to form as Bouchard started to become more popular. There were a lot of people, when looking at Bouchard's publications and noticing that each individual pair of twins seemed to have just totally random overlaps that were unrelated from pair to pair, who asked, where was he getting these things? How was he acquiring these random bits of information from these individuals? How did he know to ask what the dog's name was for both gyms or what beer they preferred? Lots of them said, if I met you for the first time, I probably wouldn't ask whether or not you chewed your nails to the nub or whether or not you really liked drinking Miller Lite versus other beers. How did he come to those conclusions? How did he find these overlaps? And this is where Bouchard's story took a bit of a turn. Bouchard admitted when being interviewed and when looking at his data that these overlaps were just the things he was reporting. The lack of overlaps, he didn't often report in these things. He said he'd asked these pairs of siblings hundreds of questions, trying to see where the overlaps lied between them. And to many statisticians and people knowledgeable about how these things worked out, this was a huge problem because many of them realized that if we take any two random people in the world and pair them together, asking them hundreds of questions, there's a good chance that any two pair of individuals are going to have a number of overlaps between them. Yes, there were a few more overlaps between these twins than we would anticipate, but Lots of statisticians and psychologists started to say that we need to back off on celebrating how monumental these effects are. Essentially, they said, whatever we stumble upon could be interesting, but we don't want to make too much of it. One of my favorite examples of kind of our tendency to be too excited about this stuff is actually something that's referenced in one of my favorite Radiolab episodes ever. For those of you that have never heard Radiolab, I encourage you to check it out, in particular the link that you see listed here on this slide, because within it, they talk about our obsession with randomness and how we tend to see links as being more meaningful than they actually are. And they give this really great analogy called the blade of grass analogy, asking you to pretend that you're a blade of grass on a golf course and a golfer, for some particular reason, on some particular day, lines up and cranks a golf ball hundreds of yards, and it happens to hit you on the head. Remember, you're that blade of grass. And as a blade of grass, you might be super interested in that occurrence. You might say something like, of all the blades of grass in this field, how in the world did that golf ball hit me? But the analogy then goes on to ask, what would the golfer be thinking? Would he or she really be that entranced with the fact that the ball hit you on the head, or would it just be kind of an inevitability that some blade of grass would be hit from that golf ball in the air. 
this is what lots of people argued Bouchard was celebrating. These random things that were naturally going to hit and just happened to hit on certain places. What makes this even more problematic is we do overestimate these things. I just said that if I paired you up with anybody, you'd probably have overlaps with people. But even knowing that, you probably, if I did pair you up with somebody, believe that you were destined to be paired up with that person you were paired up with in that first trial. And if I paired you up with the second person and we found the same number of overlaps, you'd again think that there was something at play. There was some destiny bringing you to it. It's a weird phenomenon that occurs within all human beings that unfortunately lots of people argue Bouchard was sort of playing on intentionally or not. Now this on its own isn't necessarily a huge problem. Bouchard was just trying to tackle the idea of heritability from a slightly different angle. But his conclusions brought us to some weird places, right? that random things could indeed be heritable. And there are still some people in today's developmental psychology world that, that truly believe that Bouchard had stumbled upon something really important. But while Bouchard was doing this, it's important to note that at Sweden and at Penn State, there was another collaboration going on that was actually looking at how things that we assumed were heritable maybe weren't quite as heritable as we had originally thought. McLern and his colleagues over at Sweden followed identical twins who had very different life outcomes, ones that developed diseases at different rates or aged at different rates or had different problems at different rates so they could try to understand the influences that the environment might have on things that we thought were very quickly tied to our biology. And to understand how McLern did this and some of the other things that McLern did, and also to look at some of the ways that we calculate out the ratios in those sibling pairs. I encourage you to watch the other video that you see on this class site that I, I gave you a link to, because that can really highlight what else was being discovered at the same time Bouchard was running this Minnesota Twin Registry. Another thing that's probably worth noting at this point is that there have been many developmental psychologists that have gone beyond just inferring that genes could matter and instead started to dive into specific genes, specific proteins within our bodies that we know have a major impact on our development and different nuances to who we are. For those of you that haven't had a biology class or just don't remember from long ago, know that within pretty much every single one of our cells in our body, we have structures within it called the nucleus. And within that nucleus, we have other substructures that eventually contain these strands of protein that we call chromosomes. And each of these cells, not just have random chromosomes in them, but actually 23 pairs of chromosomes located within them. And we actually do have the ability to splice out those things to, to actually break up the chromosomes so we can image them like you see on the right. For those of you wondering what the difference between A and B is, the, the difference is just you've got one on the top, which is the chromosomes of a male, and one on the right, which is the chromosomes of a female. Uh, not necessarily something that we could really make much sense of just with the naked eye, but if you go deeper into those 46 chromosomes or the 23 pairs of chromosomes, you can start to look for specific protein combinations that could correlate with specific characteristics. And this has been a really big, big idea that we've started to study since we've done something pretty amazing. In the late 90s, it was even mid 90s, we started to be able to do something called sequencing a human gene, the complete set of genes that are contained within our bodies. In the era where this was discovered, lots of people believed that the ability to sequence genomes was going to open up this book that could allow us to understand all of these nuances to people that had been a mystery for decades. Nowadays, sequencing a person's what we call genome, or complete set of genes, is a fairly easy task. There's lots of websites and companies that offer you the chance to get your entire genome sequenced for just a few dollars. But what we've discovered since we've been able to sequence the human genome is that when we're looking at heritability, genes are a very complex story. If you watch the video from Gerald McLern, when he talked about genes and his interaction with the environment, you probably heard him mention that 
in different points in our life, certain genes are turned on, other genes are turned off, and often there's this constant interaction between our biology and the environment that we're exposed to. In essence, what people studying the human genome have discovered is that this penultimate goal that we had was more of a launching point than anything. It gave us the ability to, for, to finally start looking at how our genetic proclivities and environmental influences interacted with each other in a very complex way. In essence, if we want to whittle this down to something simplistic, lots of people nowadays say it's not nature or nurture that's really the source of a lot of things behind our lives. It's the interaction between nature and nurture. It's the combination of things that really do shape some of the developmental processes that unfold and some of the individual differences that we see in human beings. And if we're looking at kind of a culmination of this class, this is a great place to stop. And when we look at developmental psych, there's lots of different things that people are doing. And understanding how we study changes, how we understand the person, and also how we understand the interaction between the individual and the, the, the environment is a really key source to a lot of interest in developmental psychology. And it's been that way for decades since developmental psychology really started to take place. But where did this all start? Well, we've covered a couple different things that psychologists have looked at under the, the umbrella of developmental psychology. But how this particular branch of psychology was first formed is still something we haven't quite addressed. In our next class, we're going to be doing that. In particular, we're going to be looking at the research and theories of a very monumental figure in the formation of psychology, a gentleman named Jean Piaget. Right. For now, we're going to wrap up, and I encourage you so you can be prepared for that next video, if you haven't already, to do the readings on Piaget and make sure that you're 100% clear on what he did so you can better understand some of the things that we're going to be discussing. Until then, though, have a great day. I wish you the best, and we'll see you soon.